Um, so as she mentioned, I'm Yagnik. I work at Shopify. Uh, for those who haven't heard about it, Shopify is not Spotify. There's a big difference. We don't do anything with music streaming. Uh, we're a commerce platform, and we power nearly 165,000 stores at this point of time. Uh, so if you come to me and tell me, hey, you work at Spotify, how do they do this? I will punch you in the face. I'm kidding, not punch you, but I will be really mad. Um, so yeah, Shopify right now is roughly stats, which is around 300 million unique visits every day, uh, 8 billion in GMV, 10,000 plus in checkouts every minute, which really means for me around 50 terabyte of data coming in every day and around 80 plus servers in our Hadoop cluster handling that data load. Uh, why am I giving you these numbers? Really just to tell you that I'm handling decent amount of data. Would you call it big data or just data? Doesn't matter. But uh, it's the amount of data that I have to play with on a daily basis and uh, handle. Uh, so while doing processing all this data and taking care of it, uh, we ended up going through what I like to call the path to data enlightenment. Uh, essentially, sorry. Uh, the path to data enlightenment, in my view, is something that uh, pretty much every startup goes from, from the beginning right to the, I won't call it the end, but uh, I'd say Google does it right now, so Shopify also does it. Uh, but point being, uh, you start with something like querying your production slave. Usually it's your CEO or CTO who's directly going onto your production servers, making queries and randomly getting data. Uh, and then when they do that, it's all fine and good because you're really small, you're few people, and uh, it doesn't really affect your experience on the site or on the load or anything of that sort. Uh, but once you start scaling up uh, and you have a bunch of services happening, you have data coming from not just one place, you have data coming from multiple places, uh, then you start putting all this data into what I call a data dump. Uh, people have called it a data lake. I'm not sure if I should still call it a lake or a dump, uh, give or take. But anyway, uh, the data dump is essentially all your data going into one place, uh, usually for starters, it's like MySQL or any other database where you put in data from all the other different databases. So for instance, we have Shopify core, then we have other microservices such as billing or authentication, and all the data will collaborate together into one MySQL database where you can join all the data sets, which wasn't possible before because all these databases were separate. Uh, but sooner or later, you come and hit a dead end where you can't really query and do a lot of stuff with this data. Uh, and that's where you end up going, or that's where Shopify ended up going to Vertica, where we ended up doing the exact same what we did with MySQL, but ended up putting it in Vertica to handle the kind of load that uh, all our data sets would give us. So uh, the sole reason for that was like, that's our data warehouse. We have, it's still a data dump, because it's still all our raw data going into one place. But it's on an OLT, uh, OLAP database, where, which can handle that kind of querying and load. Uh, but uh, a year back, Shopify learned that that wasn't enough. Uh, as we IPO'd, we realized that we actually cannot trust our data at all. Uh, the problem became even worse when you have to give GMV numbers out in public, and you have to make sure that they don't change in history. Uh, so you can't just go back in time and make them different. They have to be the same. Uh, and that's where uh, one or one and a half years back, Shopify decided to model its data sets, which is uh, we started using star scheme, if anyone's familiar with that, or dimensionally modeling based on Kimball method methodologies. Uh, and the idea was that uh, we need to be able to trust our data. When someone comes to me and asks me, hey, what's the number for GMB yesterday? I should be able to confidently tell them this is it. Uh, if they come and tell me how many users we lost, uh, say, two weeks back, I still it shouldn't change when they ask me the same question two years later. Uh, and that's where the idea of building a data start startup inside Shopify came in, and that's where we are. I do want to point out, though, is uh, I put this on a graph, which is complexity versus confidence. And uh, that was the key point of this. Uh, the data sets initially, when you're querying it yourself, your confidence level is kind of if because you're working on operational data which is constantly changing. It's never, it doesn't store its history, it doesn't know anything about anything else. All it knows is its current state of time. Uh, and as you go through a data model warehouse, what you're looking for is historical data, you're looking for changes in data, and you, more so, you wanna be sure that the data is exactly how you expect it to be. 
Uh, obviously, the complexity also increases as you build. Querying raw data is super easy, but building models and actually thinking about your data is a little harder than that. Uh, it took us a good one year to figure it out and uh, build it out for ourselves. So uh, it, it does have higher complexity. During this process, there are a lot of things we learned. Uh, and the biggest being, because we've gone through these different phases of building data warehouses and building frameworks on top of that, reporting modules, uh, yada, 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 all these things has taught us a lot of a great deal of things that, uh, that are required uh, when you're building any kind of data framework. Uh, but the point being, uh, these data frameworks all, ha all have the core idea of processing data, but they all need certain aspects which make them powerful enough to do things, uh, which make them production ready, or as we, we call it in our SaaS business, that any business should have a production ready app. You're something like uptime and monitoring. So uh, taking all those concepts and applying them on data framework stack, and we ended up coming with a few of these. I'm gonna talk about each one of them individually, but I wanted to list them down so you know what's coming up. Uh, I'll be talking about metadata, uh, and it's hopefully not gonna be just meta and go figure it out yourself kind of deal. Uh, talking about instrumentation, storage, orchestration, data development, and build process. A uh, Couple things I will mention in the middle which are work in progress, uh, which is, these are my ideas, or these are Shopify's ideas, uh, but they're not hard, and they haven't, they're, they're being battle tested right now. Whether or not they're good enough, uh, I can't really say that, because uh, we're still testing these things. And I'm pretty open to discussing those op ideas and uh, get your viewpoints on that. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me on those. Uh, so going ahead, metadata. Uh, I promise I won't make it very meta, so I'm gonna talk about very specific things and give you exactly what we did and why we did it, and what, we, uh, what was the reasoning behind it. So the first thing was uh, data schema. Uh, when we started out, we had JSON, and we started dropping all these data sets into what people call data lakes. And the idea is that when you put it in a data lake, uh, you just drop the data and don't worry about the schema. Uh, what became really painful was the fact that people started dropping all kinds of fields into the JSON blob. Uh, things that didn't actually even make sense, just because they could store it somewhere. Uh, and then we started enforcing schemas. So every time you drop any kind of data set, then uh, into HDFS or any, kind, any storage that you use, uh, drop the schema with it. And what that schema has is all the fields at that current point of time, and then those, the types of those fields. So essentially, whether it's an integer, decimal, date time, money object, uh, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and uh, you would store that with the schema. I'm gonna get into storage of this schema a little later, uh, but uh, that's what the first part of the metadata is, to store the schema. Along with that schema set, we also started storing retention and privacy policies. Uh, being a public company, we had to follow a lot of rules and regulations around what all we can store and what all we cannot, and if someone asks us to come and delete their data, how do we handle that? Uh, so every schema set tells you whether this data could change in time because of some delete request or uh, how long this data is going to stay in HDFS before it's going to be purged permanently. Really depends on the data set of what kind of data you're using. So something like logs are probably going to remain forever, whereas something like uh, passwords are never going to come in and they'll be retracted under the privacy policy. Uh, next up is uh, operational metadata. I added these as fields so that these are the things that we, we started storing, but the the thing I want to focus on is the reasoning behind it. Uh, what came up quite often in our past data systems up until the model data warehouse was when people were looking at reports, uh, they would often ask, is it actually up to date? Uh, how many records did you load last time? Or how was how were you doing these things? They were also started asking questions like, where are you getting your data from? Uh, I trust this data. And then when our uh, engineers and analysts came around, they were like, but I want to know which code actually generated this data set, and how do I know about that? And then finally, because we have multiple data products, which data product is actually dropping this data set? So the metadata for operational data sets was exactly those questions being answered by the data and by the system. The idea was uh, you give every detail of which source system was putting in, and uh, when it was built, how many input-output records you would put in, and then how can you, which at which point of code you could go back and rebuild that exact same data set 
knowing that it will actually build up and give you the exact same results. Uh, next up would be business meta, uh, metadata, which is uh, definitions, questions, uh, source, and uh, owners. This is purely for business users. It had nothing to do with engineers and analysts. It was for all reports that we had that uh, you could just go in and ask questions on the portal, and it will tell you which reports match your specific questions. Uh, trying to be smart about, instead of a new manager coming in and asking for, uh, do I look for GMB or do I look for products? Do I look for shops? Instead, they could go to our portal and just ask in natural language, uh, I want to see how, many, how much that shop sold in the last uh, 10 years. And uh, it will get converted to the exact thing or the exact report that they need. Uh, so that's the kind of other metadata we started storing. What all this metadata actually was meant for was my happiness in the end. Uh, I'd say Shopify is pretty strong on uh, developer happiness. So I'd, that's why I'm saying it. they care about my happiness. And my happiness was this one chart. Uh, this is what we call overseer. Uh, the point of its existence is to help me tell what all data sets are there, what all their dependencies are, what are they dependent on, whether they passed or failed in a lost run, uh, whether they actually loaded any data set, and uh, how late or behind the data could be. Uh, this one thing tells me everything I need to know about the system at any given point of time, and all this metadata actually serves into Overseer, which is this graph. So as you can see, for example, I pointed out on one of the green dots, which is that job passed, it's uh, channel transition facts, uh, and it tells me a bunch of metadata that I need to know at that point of time. But it could be expanded into a lot more in terms of doing this, uh, doing uh, any kind of analysis. Taking it a step further, though, uh, we also use it for impact analysis, where uh, if you make any changes in schema or in any kind of metadata, you know exactly which report it will end up impacting. And uh, uh, on our, in our case, we break CI and don't let the developer merge in or an analyst merge in any changes that would actually cause a breaking change into something else. Uh, so that's the point of uh, metadata. Next up, I got a single slide for instrumentation. Uh, I think that was, as an engineer, it's critical for me to know how are my systems running. Uh, and as data developers, we're pretty used to hard drives and network failures, a uh, bunch of issues on hardware level. So what we do at Shopify is uh, we instrument literally every little detail of hardware that's running. So uh, we know how much network I.O. is happening, disk or memory I.O. happening, whether something's spiking suddenly, whether something's dead. Uh, along with that, we also have service instrumentation. When I say service instrumentation, uh, it essentially means how a service is reacting. So in our case, we use Redshift, which is uh, for loading our data sets. So is Redshift behaving properly? How does its metrics look, whether it's getting too much, too hammered? We don't have access to direct box, so we have to work with APIs. And, but the point being, every single service in your system needs to be instrumented. And finally, uh, job instrumentation. A job instrumentation could also be seen as the metadata just seen in real time. Uh, it's not dropped at the time of load, but it's dropped. It's it's being seen to you, shown to you, while it's happening. So something like this is what one of our graphs looks like, where this is one of the operational or system meta, uh, instrumentation. A job instrument job instrumentation would tell you more more of what all jobs are currently running, how many data they have, how many records they have loaded yet, and then how many records are remaining, and how they're performing overall. So that would be instrumentation. Next up would be storage. So this was a, this was a huge debate at Shopify. Initially, we started at, uh, with Vertica and putting everything in SQL. And suddenly, we're moving to JSON blobs. But uh, when we moved to JSON blobs and started using it with Spark, uh, it was pretty good. As a developer, I could see my data. But it was really painful for, for the servers itself, uh, mostly because we were loading all that data sets, parsing it again and again, and it made it really heavy. So uh, what I'm going to talk about storage is what should, be, what should you be thinking about when you're choosing your storage format? Uh, in my case, I'd recommend Avro or Parquet, and I'm going to tell you why in either case. So first up is you want something that's uh, shareable across applications. 
what that means is different types of data applications should be able to load that data and then also drop that data. Uh, Avro being a standard format, Parquet is a little less standard than Avro, but uh, I'll, they're, two, they're differences that are pretty major to consider. Uh, next thing is fast to parse. So the idea is JSON is super slow to parse when you're loading from uh, disk every single time or uh, putting it on a net on a network uh, band, taking over your network bandwidth when you're moving it around. Whereas Avro is binary encoded, uh, which is uh, fairly nice because it's super tiny, and when compressed, it could easily take care of your stuff. Next thing is. Uh, the wrapper should also worry about schema. So I talked about schema earlier, but how do you actually store it? Uh, my recommendation would go storing the schema inside the wrapper, which Avro does. Uh, and uh, what, what it does is, for every single file, it will store the records, and it will also store the schema that rec all those records conform to. Uh, next up would be schema evolution. Uh, sorry, I am getting a little fasty, but. Uh, the point with schema, uh, schema evolution is your data is going to change. Every single time you load any new data, every single time you have any migration, every single time a developer decides to change any event, uh, your data is going to look different. It might be something as trivial as adding a field, or it might be something a little more complex like changing the data type. Uh, and your library or your schema library should be able to handle that kind of evolution and be able to go from one to the other without making all the downstream jobs break. So schema evolution is something that Avro right now supports. A lot of other libraries like Thrift and Protobuf also supports that. But uh, in Hadoop land, Avro is probably the best choice. Uh, so what are your op options? Avro, Thrift, and Protobuf are all row-based uh, row uh, tools. Uh, and then. Uh, Parquet and Orc are more of columnar. Uh, the idea behind being, making it columnar is uh, it's much easier to actually run a query on it because when you're running a query on it, it won't load the whole data set, whereas it will only load a partial data set and therefore be a little nice to your machines and your memory. What I would recommend is do not, please, for the love of God, don't use JSON, CSV, or text files because uh, initially it might be good, but as you scale your systems, they don't scale with it. And uh, you need to be able to, you need something that scales as your data grows. Uh, next up is orchestration. By or orchestration, I mostly mean running workflows. Uh, Uzi is probably the standard right now, but Shopify had, a, ha had multiple experiences. We went from Luigi uh, to Askban, and now we're going to Uzi. And uh, the biggest uh, main point was be able to schedule stuff when data changes which uh, uh, something that Askaban, and I believe Luigi supports it in, in an iffy manner, but uh, Askaban doesn't, and Uzi does. When you're picking up anything that you're orchestrating, you should be thinking about whether it's event or time-based scheduling. Uh, the idea behind event is whether that event could be a data is dropped, or an event, something that's coming from some kind of message bus. Or in our case, sometimes it's time-based. For example, our CFO looks for his reports at 7 in the morning every single day. So every single day, uh, there's a job at 12, which makes sure that all the data from yesterday is ready for him to look at at 7 in the morning. So support for both of them is extremely important. Next up would be notifications. Uh, for notifications, what you're, what you're looking at is uh, essentially Whenever something goes wrong or something's going haywire, uh, it should tell the person responsible to fix it or to look at it. Most uh, workflows now have some kind of notification or failure emails. But if you could have something smarter like, I'm not loading enough number of records, uh, then that would be something even more awesome. I don't believe anything out there that tells you something like that. But uh, for failure notifications, pretty much all of them do that. And lastly, uh, metrics and logs. When we were initially looking at things, no one really cared about metrics and logs that much. They were like, eh, we'll worry about it when we need it. But uh, logs are critical when you're building data sets and data products. Uh, knowing how much data you're lo loading, knowing uh, what all is happening in your current data product or current application is critical to any data engineer. And uh, you should think about, when you're picking up an orchestration system, you should think about both metrics and logs uh, and whether it supports it or not. 
this is probably probably my favorite slide because this is what I care most deeply about. Uh, it's small, it's just one, but uh, matters the most to me. When you're building a data product, uh, don't just care about your data. Care about who's going to work with it, uh, who's going to be building on it, both analysts and engineers, and uh, how are they going to work with it. So for in our case, and what we made called Starstream, uh, which is our framework, uh, Starstream has a bunch of things in it which allows uh, happy developers, or I hope they're happy. Uh, and uh, some of the things are impact analysis, which is what I showed you earlier. Overseer is an impact analysis tool. And what it does is read all the metadata and knows about when things are going to break and notifies you before you break them, as opposed to most data products where you will find out after you broke something that you broke it. So uh, some, have something which allows you impact analysis and uh, tells you in, on CI whether that's possible. Next up is CI. Uh, I'm giving an example of Shopify and Starstream. We run on Spark, and every single transformation that we do on our data is actually tested uh, in continuous integration. So we are uh, testing on how, whether that data is going to pass or not, whether it's allowed or not, whether it meets our standards or not, and uh, should be part of your data product. Next one is probably the hardest thing that came out of our experience. Uh, every time a data engineer was building something, they would either work with a very small subset of data, which is not representative of the actual data profile uh, locally, or they would be working on the whole Hadoop cluster and taking over resources because they want to run some job over every single page view that happened on Shopify. Uh, what we realized was that if we could somehow deterministically bring down a set of data and then let developers use that, then they could just set a percentage, and then we would call the data. So the idea is uh, you give it a percentage, and then you, what you get back is the actual profile of the data being pulled down to your local machine, uh, which, which is representative of what's on the production servers. So for example, uh, if I have page view fact or page views of Shopify, and uh, they're highly biased towards certain pages, then the cult data would, should also look high, highly biased to that data set. And how we do this is uh, we, store, we run a job which basically creates ratios of cult data present for you, and you could just download those. So uh, what it would do is uh, go over the whole data set, get its profile and how every field looks like, uh, and how often they, that field is seen, and then take certain ratios, so 1, 10, 50 percentage, and uh, get those ready in HDFS every day so that you could just download that data set and build with it. A step further with culling is you never work with a single data set. You're always joining different data sets. So what you, could do, uh, what, what you could do a step ahead is if you give it a job, it knows all its dependencies and gets all the data sets in a culled manner, which will join how you expect it. So th that's the next thing that we did where we could you give it, say for instance, a fact building job about admin page views, which requires page views, it requires user details, it requires shop details. Uh, and what Culling will do is go into every single data set and uh, look at how they join and pull it down for your local machine, for your developer to develop. Uh, after that uh, comes reconciliation. Uh, most people, at least uh, in my experience at Shopify, uh, every time we had data products, we would just change things and change the data with it. But once we became, uh, once we started modeling our data and we went public, we couldn't really just change our data, hoping that nothing else would change. We needed to be sure that any, anytime you make any code change, it will not cause change in the data sets that's not expected. Uh, so someone in the finance team joked about and called it an RDD, which is an abstract layer of Spark. Uh, but what it from our perspective, it means is reconciliation develop, uh, driven development. The idea is every time you make a code change and when you push it to GitHub, uh, a bot will go and run your job and run the same job on master uh, and see if the data has changed where you expected it to. So in our case, what the, jo what the command really looks like is reconcile job one, and I expect only column one to change. And what it will do is uh, run both the data sets, compare completely, and then make sure that only one column changed. And finally, uh, error reporting. Uh, at Shopify, we decided to differentiate between filters and rejects. Uh, I'm going to go a little 
bit into it. This might be, I'd say this might be a, a little dicey of a topic because uh, there were stronger arguments there, and I'm guessing there'll be so, so strong arguments here. But uh, every time you, in our, in our data sets, you cannot just filter your data, you could also reject your data, which is things that I know that are crap and I'm gonna get rid of it early on. Uh, which is, whereas filter is just, I'm gonna get rid of it, but there's no good reason. Rejects are actually stored separately with the job, knowing this, this is the reason that I don't like the job, uh, don't like the data set, I'm gonna get rid of it. Uh, some people have argued that one or the other is not required. Uh, we can talk more about it if you feel strongly about it, but uh, that's what we do right now. Um, next up is uh, build process. This, this is work in progress. We're still trying to figure it out, but uh, I was mentioning to someone when I was talking about presenting here that uh, incremental and full builds is something that's uh, very much in talks in the, Hadoop, in the data ecosystem right now. When I talk about incremental, what I mean is so you only look at the data that has changed from the last time you looked at the data. So it's only diff logs or only change sets. Whereas full build is you can assume that every time you process your data, you will get the whole data set and you're gonna look at it completely. Uh, one thing that we definitely learned is don't worry about your aggregations as part of your incremental job. So if you're only looking at diff logs, don't try to be smart and go like, I'll just add it or I'll just take the mean and do whatever of those sorts of things where uh, when you're aggregating your data or taking sums. It's a pretty hard problem and if you have a mistake, you need to figure out, you need to have a rollback strategy which is not straightforward in incremental jobs. Uh, I would suggest having a separate job that would uh, think about uh, just aggregating. So you have one job that does your incremental part which is cleaning and conforming it and then you have your aggregation part which just goes over the whole data sets and aggregates it which is fairly straightforward. And then finally, um, MOTM, which is what we call min of the maxes. When are you, whenever you're working with a bunch of data sources, then uh, you should be worried about uh, how, how far ahead each of those data sources are compared to each other. So for instance, at Shopify we have orders and each order has many line items. Uh, but they both could come into the Hadoop at different point of time. So you could theoretically have an order which does not have all its line items in it. Uh, it's more of a consistency problem, but uh, what we do with that is you make sure that you only look at min of the maxes, so you only look at the timestamps, which is the minimum of all, all the max values of all the data sets. So say for instance, orders is present till yesterday, and line items are only present till day before, then you only process for that incremental job till day before, because the, the, the rest of the data set is actually still missing. Uh, this is still work in progress, so I, I don't have a lot to add to the build process part, but uh, that's uh, still building up, I guess. And finally, these are things that I haven't really talked about, and we're still trying to figure it out, but uh, we're not sure. Uh, something about data movement, how data moves from one place to the other, and how it should be stored. Uh, we're using HDFS right now, but it might be a better idea, and it might be a better idea to think about another way of storing these data sets or moving them from our source data, which is Scoop, or in our case, custom build solution, uh, to something else. And people have talked about Kafka and streaming, but uh, data movement is something uh, I believe right now is highly dependent on the company you're in, what's your SLA, and how much you're looking to, or how early you want that data. Uh, second is data quality. Uh, Personally, I feel that building multiple frameworks for data quality that would evolve with the company, I, we haven't come up to a solution which, is, which would be ideal for building a data quality framework which could also evolve as your data products evolve. Uh, I'd love to hear your ideas if you have any. And finally, partitioning, uh, that's uh, again something that's left to the company and how you query your data. You could partition on date times, but I've seen, in our case, we also partition on shops uh, that's, again, very specific to the kind of queries you're running. So I won't talk about that. Uh, that's mostly it. At this point of time, I'll open up the floor for questions, anything that I could answer.
hello uh, you talked about the storage uh, means how you are uh, how you guys are storing the data so you talked about uh, oz or not oz uh, you talked about orvo thrift or other protocols sorry i i'm sorry i didn't catch that last part hello yeah so you talked about the storage like you you are saying you you guys are using orvo or other uh, storage uh, protocols to to store the data so you are talking in context of sdfs or uh, you are talking in terms of some no sequels means how hdfs mostly okay uh, you, so you mean uh, you guys are storing the data which comes under files in form of orvo so orvo is actually marshaling or unmarshaling stuff for you yeah okay okay so you guys are not using any no sequel to query the data means uh, it's it's more towards you always have a batch processing towards your data uh to to give some meaningful information to you guys right only recently we started using cassandra uh to store our data which is only needed for incremental jobs so something like if you're doing a large join uh, okay we look it up in cassandra but all that data is also present in hdfs in case you're doing a batch processing job so we do use nosql in our stack okay. but uh, it's not primary Uh, it's secondary to hdfs okay and uh, how's the performance differs like as you told uh, as you suggested uh, no never to store the data like in csv or uh, in json format which is readable sometime means you can like uh, at some point of time we need to cat the data means you need to just look up the data but uh, if we uh, you are using all these protocols uh, like uh, which are encoding or decoding the data to make it more uh, to make it small or to process with it better or so uh, is that a challenge means you always need to do processing on the data to look into the data even uh that was exactly the reason we selected json initially uh, which was developer happiness we need to look into the data itself but uh, what happened uh what we realized was that a hue offers it that you could look at avro data mm -hmm. and secondly uh the performance implications of it are extremely high uh, i don't have the graph up my, uh, but i can show you the memory difference between a spark job that loads into json versus avro is significantly different and the amount of time it takes to load move it from one box to the other over network is also significantly different okay means that that's a significant improvement you, you saw and in terms of orchestration you 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 talked about oz so it's more towards uh, jobs uh, uh, combinations means if you if you have a big task to do so it's more towards a job orchestration Absolutely, right yeah okay thank you Any other questions? Hi. So you talked about representative data. Uh, so can you bit explain more? Sorry, uh, representing data. In yeah, means you were telling about that representative set from the uh, actual set. If you have a uh, very big data set, you want a representative set from that, right? Right. Correct. So. Uh, Okay, uh, let me put it better. The example of page views. So, say for instance, you have a hundred million page views happening in an hour, uh, and uh, when you have those hundred million page views, uh, you can't exp or in our case, it's it's a lot more. But in general, page views is a pretty high, big data set, uh, and uh, you can't expect your analyst to always go in production machines and run their jobs on the whole data set to see if it's working. Uh, so, what we realized was that. what we needed to give an analyst or an engineer is the ability to get that same data set locally but it can't be the whole data set i can't ask them to download a terabyte every day what i want them to do is get a gigabyte but that gigabyte should be very much representative of the data uh and when i say representative the profile should match so uh the number of null values how often a page is seen those should still relatively be similar or the probability of them being different is very low uh so what we wanted the idea with culling was that you deterministically figure out how the data looks and then also give a percentage so like i as an analyst i could say i want to work with 10% of this data so i give it 10% and cull it and it will go look at the whole page views look at its profile and then select rows that match the criteria and then download it on the local machine so we run this job on a, a on a daily basis for our critical data sets so something like gmb or orders which are pretty high and then we will store it on a daily basis for 1% of the data 10 25 50% and then an analyst can start with just working with 1% build their job 
and then go, go from that to testing it on 25%, making sure they caught all the assumptions, testing it on 50%, and then we let them run it on production to make sure that they caught every edge case that possibly existed in that data set, and all their assumptions are still valid. Uh, so that's the idea behind culling. Okay. Uh, is this offline processing you do? I mean, is it how much time it takes it takes to do the culling? Uh, it depends on the data set. So something like page views would probably take a few hours, whereas uh, something like shops would probably happen in like 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Thanks. Got someone. I think someone's there. Hey, uh, you were talking about continuous integration. Um, just wanted to know what kind of tools are you using and what exactly happens underneath. Like, uh, since we are talking about big data and uh, how do you exactly, you know, measure the code quality? For example, for the sure. commit or so, how it does it break and things like that. So at uh, at Shopify, we built something called Starscream, which is a framework that I cannot talk about because it's not open source. But uh, the idea is the Starscream is something use something to build dimensionally model data, or star schema. Uh, and what we did was, it's based on Spark. So we took all the Spark primitives, uh, made a mock out of it, and then every single transformation you do on your data set, you actually have a corresponding test for it. So for example, uh, in your you have your fixtures, which is your test data, and then you apply those transformations to make sure that the data is actually correct. Uh, the CI tool does that, runs it in mock, and also runs it on a actual Spark cluster with test data to make sure that the transformations and the assumptions are correct. And they still hold true when someone changes the code. And then finally, what it does is, uh, whenever you're, it does the impact analysis, because it over, so every time you deploy to CI, uh, every time you send a branch to GitHub and you enable CI, uh, it will send a request to Overseer, which is the impact analysis tool, which knows about all the data sets, all the jobs, and all the schemas. And it will see if the, anywhere in the DAG you're breaking any assumption that someone else made and then tell you that this is broken, you cannot merge it in. And that assumption goes all the way till Tableau, which is our reporting framework. So uh, we know that if I made a change in the name of the field that's being used in Tableau, that will not get merged in because it will be read on CI. Uh, those are the two primary things that CI does for us, which is impact analysis and then code coverage. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Excuse me. So here, here. So you mentioned about the culling, right? So yep. basically, you have let's say terabytes of data, and you want to give only GBs of data to your analyst people to explore it more better way. Okay. So how you are giving this freedom to analyst people? Like you are giving it through Redshift or what? Basically, you are using. Is it a day job or weekly job? Uh, we do a, we do a daily job right now for most of our critical data sets. Our analysts are allowed to run a job for a specific data set which is not already present for them. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's what we do right now. So you could run it yourself or you, or, uh, you could pick one of the data sets that's present on HDFS. And then uh, it's stored as a file on HDFS, so you have to download it. But it's significantly smaller. So for storage, what you are using? Like which technology? Uh, sorry, for downloading. For storage, it yeah. For storage. Uh, just uh, Hadoop commands, like Hadoop FS. Okay. So command line arguments. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have a question. I'm Here. sorry, where are you? Awesome. Yeah. So uh, I have a question like, how do we handle inconsistent data? So as we store the data format that we follow is in blocks or some other kind. So the data is continuously changing. So how do we deal with the inconsistency of that data? Uh, so something like that happened with our Kafka data source, where the data was constantly changing uh, with event streams. Uh, so say, for instance, you have an event for admin, admin being all of Shopify admin. And then all the events coming in had different profile attached to it. Uh, and what we realized was that we w that was uh, just having an open fire hose was a bad idea. And we moved to curated data sets. So every single event stream is a single type of event. And the schema only changes as much as your database would change in its schema. So only once in a while, your schema changes. And we manage that with Avro schema evolution. So Avro allows you to change the schema and be able to tell you whether it's backward or forward compatible. 
uh, in which case, in Kafka's case, for example, uh, you have your Avro schema, and then if you ch make a change to that schema, if it's not forward compatible, it will actually break things, and it'll, the CI will break and won't let you merge that change in, because you broke something. But uh, if it's compatible, it'll just let you have it. So adding a field is always a compatible change, whereas changing the data type is an incompatible change in most cases. So that's how we did it. Thanks. We have time only for one more question. Hey, hi. Um, so I have uh, basically two very quick questions, um, specifically from a monitoring point of view, mm -hmm. to see if everything is working fine and things like that. Do you have an in-house custom solution which you have built for monitoring? Sorry, do, do I have an in-house what? For monitoring, in an in-house solution. Uh, we use uh, Datadog. Uh, which is graphite based okay. uh, for monitoring. So it's for real time monitoring, that is. Right. Uh, along with that, we use Splunk for our log monitoring. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's it. Like our code base sends events to those things. Okay. And um, for visualizations? Uh, again, Datadog, Datadog is okay. like they present a visualization library. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sweet. Last question. Two more minutes. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi, this is Praveen. Uh, I want to understand, like, uh, did you ever get a uh, problem, of fa uh, did you ever face problem in uh, uh, compliance uh, where uh, you store the uh, PI information at different geographical location and uh, use Hadoop Federation in any way? Any Sorry, case? can you repeat? Uh, I stored PI, in PII information where? So the concept of Hadoop Federation, did you use or any other methodology you used? Uh, we have been looking at it, but uh, we haven't implemented anything for Hadoop Federation. We just handle it at the time of loading. Okay. Uh, so we have a custom, instead of scoop, we have a poor man's scoop, which what we call longboat, and we built it in-house. Uh, so we have PII data, hap like PII control happening at that layer itself. Okay. But right now we don't use anything on Hadoop side. Okay, but how do you manage to use that data to show it uh, to the whole uh, geography? So we have a central service for PII, which tells us what all what all rules are applicable for private data, okay. and uh, whether that data has been removed or not. So we already are aware of deletes in our data set. Uh, things we need to care about is something like an email, or sorry, something like a phone number, which needs to be retracted. So you're not allowed to store the whole phone number. You're only allowed to store the area code. Uh, okay. So we have certain rules in our, we have a separate service which manages different rules and knows about different kinds of PII data. Uh, so we hit that service and we ask it whether this field needs to be PII compliant, and if yes, then what kind of rule or uh, retracting logic do we need to apply to it? And uh, you give it the field, it'll apply the retracting logic, and then you store it into, HDF, uh, into HDFS, yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got it. Uh, I, f I feel this is I'm, a custom I'm solution. really sorry, but I'm going to have to cut you. Okay. And please take this offline. Sure.